All right, let's open in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time to come together to, to praise you uh, for your love and to, to hear about the greatness of your love. Uh, we pray that you'd equip us with wisdom, and we pray that you'd bless the sermon, and we pray that you'd bless our fellowship. And we thank you for your grace and amen. Uh, so today we are continuing our series called The Essentials of Effective Parenting. And in this series, we're going to be looking at eight different essentials in detail, loving your children, disciplining your children, uh, evangelizing your children, discipling your children, equipping your children, empowering your children, leading your children by example, and praying for your children. And I repeat this every time because I want us to remember it. Uh, but anyways, for each of these eight essentials, we're going to specifically look at not just how to do them, but how to do them well. We need to view each of these as spectrums, not as binary matters. It's not just a matter of, do I discipline my child, or do I discipline my children, but do I discipline them consistently and in a reasonable and helpful way? Um, and lastly, for the introduction, I want to say that this series is for everyone. It is not just for those who are currently parents or currently expecting to be parents. Um, it, it certainly is for those who are parents. Uh, and, you know, if you're married, if you're single, if you're engaged, there's a good chance, humanly speaking, that if you're alive, you will be a parent one day. Even if you don't think you will be, there, there's a chance you might be. And there's, there's principles in this series that are useful otherwise, apart just from parenting. So anyways, today we're continuing um, our section on disciplining your children well, or disciplining your children effectively. So I'm going to start off like I did last week about defining what I mean by discipline. There's a lot of different connotations that the word discipline can have, and different people might picture some very different situations uh, when they hear the word discipline, so I want to bother to clarify it. Uh, discipline is the act of administering imposed consequences to an individual for the express purpose of helping them learn a specific change of behavior. And, uh, and I also want to clarify some things that either aren't discipline or aren't godly discipline. Uh, and the first one I changed the wording on from last week. Last week I, I said punishment is not discipline, but I'm like, eh, those two are syn synonymous enough that let's just change the wording to make it a slightly <laughs> bit more clear. I'm going to say vengeance is not discipline. Vengeance is not discipline, because discipline is administering a consequence for the sake of teaching someone. But vengeance is administering consequences out of anger or out of desire for justice to be done. And vengeance is not discipline. And we shouldn't be taking vengeance on our kids. Let's look at, look at Romans 12, verse 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So vengeance is not discipline, and also abuse is not godly discipline. Disciplining your kids shouldn't cause severe pain, and it should never be anything that causes damage or a, or last, a lasting effect on them physically. And lastly, I want to say manipulation is not godly discipline. Using condemnation or guilt tripping to try to change behavior, the behavior of your children is not loving and it's not biblical. And there is some nuance here. I do want to mention that I didn't mention last week. There is some nuance because if they're to be emotionally healthy, they have to feel some level of guilt. If a person sins and never feels guilt, that's not a good sign. That's not emotionally healthy. So it's not necessarily wrong to do things that make them feel guilt. You shouldn't try to avoid making them feel guilty, but you certainly shouldn't use guilt as your primary means of changing their behavior. Because if you do that, you're just going to lead them to develop struggles with condemnation. So manipulation is not godly discipline. And before we get to the part that isn't review, I do want to cover again what the Bible says about disciplining. So let's look at some, some passages from Proverbs. Proverbs 22, verse 15. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Proverbs 13, verse 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. 
My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. So when we discipline our children, that's helping us to reflect the love of God in a balanced and accurate way. Because God disciplines the children whom he loves and delights in. Let's look at Proverbs 19 verse, I mean 29 verse 17. Discipline your son and he will give you rest. He will give delight to your heart. Proverbs 29 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Let's also look at um, Proverbs 19.18. Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. And lastly, Proverbs 23, verses 13 and 14. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. So discipline is necessary uh, for children, and it, it's good for them. We talked about that last week. So if you missed last week's, it'd be good to check it out on YouTube or Spotify or our website. Um, so we're not going to get much into that this week. We're more going to get into the practicals, the how to discipline effectively versus not effectively. I'm sure we've all seen lots of people discipline kids in ways that weren't effective, and we've all probably done that ourselves, even if we're not parents. If you've ever just been in a school, if you've been to a middle school or a preschool or any school, you have seen discipline happen unaffectedly <laughs> at least once or twice. So we should want to learn to discipline effectively. I'm going to briefly answer a question before we get started with how to discipline well, because uh, I didn't really find a good place to put it in elsewhere in the sermon. Um, when should you start disciplining your kids? At what age? When are they ready to be disciplined? How early is too early? Um, so the basic answer to this, or the, the guiding principle, would be you should start disciplining them as soon as they're old enough to be disobedient. So that's, that's still kind of vague. That doesn't, you don't necessarily, well, no, we're going to clarify it. But anyways, once they're old enough to be disobedient or defiant, and you can usually tell when they're being disobedient or defiant even before they're old enough to talk. Because everyone learns to listen before they learn to talk. No human being other than Adam and Eve in all of human history has ever learned to talk uh, before they learned. Well, Adam and Eve knew how to talk when they knew how to listen. But every other human in human history learned to listen before they learned to talk. So before your children are old enough to talk, they're going to understand some of the things you're saying to them. And usually you can tell whether or not they can understand you by either their body language or their facial expressions uh, and stuff like that. And you can usually tell whether or not they're purposefully ignoring you. And if they're being disobedient or defiant, then you should discipline it. So once they're old enough to be disobedient or defiant, that's almost certainly going to be later than six months old, but sooner than 12 months old. Now, I would just say that as a, a guideline. That's almost certainly going to be later than six months old, but sooner than 12 months old. And, uh, and when you think that is will be up to you. So let's talk about how to discipline well. I've got seven principles, seven tips, seven guidelines I want to mention today. Uh, the first one is always punish defiance. Uh, it's also important that I reworded the, the first thing about what isn't discipline as a vengeance isn't discipline, because a few times today I am going to use punish synonymously with discipline. Uh, but always discipline or always punish defiance. So why, why is that important? What's, what's the deal with that? Well, it's your job to teach your children obedience. And obedience to you is something they need to learn. Let's look at Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. 
Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So God wants uh, children to obey their parents, and children learning to obey their parents is good for them. It's a, it's a good habit, and it will help them in other areas of life. Because once they get older and move out, they're still going to have to uh, submit to the government, and they're going to have to submit to their boss. Um, so learning obedience is something everyone has to do in one sense or another. But it's good for children to learn to obey their parents. And it's the parent's job to teach children obedience. Children aren't just naturally obedient because no one is naturally obedient. We all have a sin nature and, you know, we all need to be taught obedience. And it's the parent's job to teach them obedience. If you don't teach them obedience, no one else will. And the primary way they learn obedience is through trial and error. But trial and error is only going to teach them if they get disciplined. They're only going to learn from their disobedience if there's consequences for their disobedience. And if there aren't consequences for disobedience, they're not going to learn to obey. So that's the main reason you should uh, punish defiance or punish rebellion. But there's a reason I say always punish defiance, because it's very important that you're consistent on this. Um, When you discipline your kids for disobeying, you're teaching them that there's consequences for disobedience. And that is very much something you want to teach them. You want them to learn that. You want them to think that, because that is correct. That is a fact of life. There are consequences for disobedience. When they uh, grow up and move out, if they break the law and get caught, there will be consequences. And when they break God's law, they will get caught by God, and sooner or later, there will be consequences. The fact that there are consequences for disobedience is a fact of life, and it's something you want your children to learn. So when you, when you discipline your kids for disobeying, you're teaching them that there are consequences for disobedience. But when you don't discipline, or when you forget or neglect to discipline them, you're teaching them that there's not consequences for disobedience, or that there won't be. And when you sometimes discipline, but sometimes don't, you're teaching them that there might be consequences for disobedience, uh, which will probably just lead them to think that maybe I can get away with it this time. So it's very important that you're consistent on this. It's very important that they learn the principle that disobedience has consequences. That is your goal to teach them that. That should be your goal to teach them that. They do need to learn that disobedience has consequences. And the only way they're going to learn that effectively is is if you consistently provide consequences. And I do want to give, um, before we move on to the next tip, one Uh, caveat about this, be careful about giving multiple warnings to your children. So sometimes it's easy, uh, because you know, you want to be gracious, you want to give them a chance to obey, maybe a chance to to have mercy. So sometimes you say, um, you know, Johnny, pick this up now, and then he doesn't do it. Johnny, pick this up now, and you give them multiple chances. But if you do that super frequently, you're really just training them to not take you seriously. If you consistently don't discipline until the fourth or fifth time that they disobey, you're teaching them nothing mom and dad say matters until the fourth or fifth time they say it. If you regularly give multiple warnings, you're training them to not take you seriously. And that, that's a fact. So that is the first tip we have. Always punish defiance. Uh, the second one is pick reasonable rules. So if you're going to have a, the goal of always punishing defiance, then you better have reasonable rules. You better have rules that you will actually care to enforce. Or rather, you shouldn't have rules that you won't care to enforce. And there's plenty of other reasons why it's important that you have reasonable rules or reasonable expectations of your children. Um, 
If you don't have reasonable expectations or if you have unreasonable rules, that's probably going to drive them to anger, which God warned fathers, particularly, and parents not to do. We want to have reasonable rules because we want to be reasonable. Um, you know, it says in James that wisdom that comes from heaven is reasonable. You should want to be a reasonable person. And as a parent, you should want to have reasonable expectations and reasonable rules. So anyways, I've got uh, three things I want to say about having reasonable rules. First off, don't forbid children from acting like children. Um, you know, you still should discipline disobedience, but don't, don't forbid children from acting like children. So children have limitations, they're not adults, and there's a few things that are just kind of inevitable. Children have a limited ability to sit still. That's not going to change, and you might think you can change it. You're wrong. They have a limited ability to sit still. Now, that doesn't mean you can't teach them to sit still, but it, it's going to take time, it's going to take practice, and they can only learn so much in each age period. They have a limited ability to sit still. Not no ability, a limited ability. An another example of, you know, reasonable expectations for children. Toddlers are going to be upset when they don't get their way. This is something Teresa and I are going through a lot. Yeah. Um, but toddlers are going to be upset when they don't get their way. That doesn't mean they get to act however they want when they get upset, but you can't expect them to not get upset. You shouldn't tell them that they're not allowed to get upset, especially if they're a toddler. That doesn't mean you just tolerate them uh, kicking people or throwing things when they get upset. You should forbid that, but you shouldn't expect them to not get upset. Um, you know, something Teresa and I have been learning, part of being a toddler is just learning to, uh, to not get in your way Toddlers have more desires than they've ever had before in their existence. They've never had as many desires as they have when they're two. Because they've never been able to, to do as many things. So they're just overwhelmed with this new experience of having so many desires. And since they're human and live on earth, they have to learn to not always get their way. But you can only learn to not get your way by experience. Um, and so it's, it's going to be some tough times for it a little bit. But, but don't expect them to not get upset when they don't get their way. But that doesn't mean you should just let them do whatever they want. So don't forbid children from acting like children. <coughs> Secondly, don't have rules without reasons. So if you have little kids, you don't necessarily have to tell them your reasons. I, I do think it's fine if you have little kids... Uh, small children to sometimes tell them something to do and say, because I said so, even though I think you shouldn't do that with teenagers. Um, but you should still have reasons that you know for the rules that you have, even if your children don't know your reasons. If you're going to have a rule for your kids, you should have a logical reason for it, and you should be able to articulate that logical reason to yourself. Because how else do you know if your rules are reasonable or not? And also, as they get older, you're going to have to tell them the reasons behind each rule. Because your job is to raise a competent adult who can live life on their own. But you need to realize that as soon as they move out, anything that they don't see a reason for, they are going to immediately forget or ignore. So... By the time they're ready to move out, you have to have taught them the reasons for anything you want them to keep doing. Because they, they are going to just forget it or ignore it once they move out if they don't see reasons for it. Because you're not going to go over to their house and discipline them <laughs> when they're an adult. <laughs> uh, and the last thing I would say about picking reasonable rules or how to, is try to think win-win. Um, so a lot of the time, there's rules that you're going to set for your children that might keep them from doing things that they want to do. But it's a good habit to try to think of ways for them to still be able to do things they want to do while still achieving whatever result 
that you're hoping to achieve. So for example, if your teenager wants to be able to go out on their own and you want them to be safe, you could just forbid them from going out on their own, um, or you could try to think of a way for them to be able to go out on their own and still be safe. And in general, trying to think win-win or trying to think of a way to achieve both results is a good habit to have and to practice with your children. If your child wants to eat a cookie but they've already had enough sugar for today, rather than just telling them no and that being all you tell them, try to think of something else they can eat and that they'll enjoy that tastes good but that doesn't have as much sugar in it. And so this is important because um, having a habit of looking for win-win solutions will help you have a better relationship with your children. It will help you not drive them to anger. But it's also modeling good relational skills for them. This is what you want them to think like as an adult. You don't want them to grow up and get married and think, well, it's either my way or my spouse's way, and there's no way we can have both. You don't want them to think like that. You want them to grow up, and when they get married, to be able to think, well, my spouse wants this, and I want that. Is there some way we can have both? So try to think win-win. All right, the third tip I want to give. Uh, don't punish or don't discipline for things that you didn't tell them are wrong, or that you didn't tell them to not do. So... Disciplining your children for things that you didn't tell them are wrong is unfair and is a poor example of godly authority. Let's look at Proverbs 24, verse 12. If you say, Behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay each man according to his work? God takes into account whether or not... Um, when we sin, whether or not it was out of ignorance. Did we actually know that God forbids said thing? Did we know that it was wrong? Not only that, but God doesn't hide his will from us. He doesn't hide his will from us and then punish us for not knowing it. God makes his will and his expectations very clear in his word. And if you have a habit or if you frequently discipline your kids for things you didn't tell them are wrong then that's probably going to drive them to anger. That's probably going to frustrate them. If you uh, have a job and your boss frequently uh, writes you up for things they never told you are wrong, you're going to be pretty frustrated with your boss. And we saw earlier in Ephesians 6 verse 4 that God warns parents and especially fathers to not drive their children to anger. So kind of as an outworking of this, that you shouldn't punish your children for things you didn't tell them are wrong, this means you're going to want to put an effort in into telling them things ahead of time. If there's a certain way you want them to, ex uh, you expect them to behave all the time, you should teach them that before uh, disciplining them. I will give one exception, though. Um, there is kind of a concept, even a, a legal concept, of should have known better. Um, so I'll give an example. If, if I have an eight-year-old who keys my car or slashes my tire, I probably didn't command them, hey, don't ever key my car or don't ever slash my tires. But that doesn't matter. They should have known better. <laughs> There, there is a fair legal concept of should have known better. You know, I'll give a, a work-related example. Well, nah, we're, we're a few minutes behind schedule. I won't, actually. But, um, you know, if it's... Yep. If it's... And, and some of these things are just extension of other rules. If, if they know that they shouldn't hit their siblings, but then they push their sibling down the stairs, should have known better. You shouldn't avoid punishing them just because you've never specifically told them not to push their sibling down the stairs. They should have known better, and you should expect that they should have known better because it's so similar to another rule that you have, don't hit your siblings. 
So anyways, with that exception, don't punish your kids for things you didn't tell them are wrong. Doing so is unfair and a poor example of godly authority, and it's going to be very frustrating for them. Number four, be prepared to handle negative responses to discipline. So it's important that you're prepared to handle negative responses to discipline because they're going to happen sometimes. Um, And you need to be able, you need to know what to do when they happen, and you need to be able to stick it out with discipline and not just give up because of it. So there's three specific negative responses to discipline uh, I want to talk about briefly. Um, Whining. It's, it's going to be very common, especially for small children, to respond to discipline with whining or complaining. But the main thing I would say about that is just don't let it stop you. Um, if, you're, if you respond to whining or complaining by backing off and not disciplining them, then your children will quickly learn that they can get away with breaking the rules as long as they complain about it afterwards. So they might whine and they might complain, but don't let that stop you. Don't let that keep you from disciplining them. Uh, The second type of negative response they might sometimes respond with is retaliation. Mm -hmm. Retaliation is when they respond to discipline with either more disobedience or with disrespect. Uh, Like you maybe put them in timeout and they hit you. That's retaliation. They need to learn not only are there consequences for disobedience, but that there's consequences for retaliation. Because if, if there's no consequences for retaliation, then they're kind of learning that there's, there's only sometimes consequences for disobedience. Because retaliation is its own act of disobedience. It's its own act of defiance. So not only should you discipline them for the original offense, but you should also make sure you discipline them appropriately for the added offense or for the retaliation. Um, you know, if, if you discipline them and they respond by calling you stupid, you should discipline them for having called you stupid. They shouldn't talk to their parents that way. They need to learn that there will be consequences for their actions. Uh, and I guess the, the last potential negative response that I'll mention is, uh, is insincere repentance. Uh, so maybe you tell them, hey, stop hitting your sister, and they respond with, okay, I'll stop hitting my sister. Then five seconds later, well, let's say five minutes. Five minutes later, they hit their sister again. Uh, that's probably an example of insincere repentance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. But, you know, they have sin natures just like we do, so sometimes they're going to respond with insincere repentance or faking repentance in order to escape the consequence. And you have to be able to spot that. And if, if you have reason to think that a, a given case of repentance is insincere repentance, you know, A, call them out on it, and B, discipline them for not obeying. All right. <clears throat> tip, tip number five. Uh, try to understand the reason behind their misbehavior. This is a good habit to have. Try to understand the reason behind their misbehavior. Try to think about it and analyze it regularly. So I'm not saying that there's a good reason behind their misbehavior, but there's always some reason for it. Because humans even though our logic isn't always that great, are logical creatures. And no one does anything without having some reason for it, even though it's probably not a good reason. But there is some reason behind their misbehavior, and it would do you well to regularly try to understand what that reason is. Understanding the reason for their misbehavior will better help you to address the problem as a whole. You know, maybe the reason they can't sit still for a certain amount of time that they usually can sit still for is maybe they've just been indoors too long today. And if they're responding to that by being disobedient, you should still discipline the disobedience, but you also have a second problem to fix. They've been inside too long today, and you should do something about that. You should find a way to let them play outside. 
you know, maybe the reason they're acting up is because they're feeling ignored. And if that is the case, you still shouldn't tolerate the disobedience, but you also need to do something about the fact that they feel ignored. And a lot of times, if, if a child is going through an issue or a struggle, how they misbehave might provide insight to the fact that they're going through a struggle. Though not all uh, misbehavior is caused by some emotional struggle. Um, but regularly trying to figure out the reasons behind their misbehavior can help you recognize important issues that you might not otherwise recognize. And it's, it's just a good habit to have. All right, so principle number six, or tip number six. Give them both consequences and guidance. So I, I'm going to have to explain what I mean by guidance, but before I explain that, I want to preface this, this point some. So there's a bit of a, a cultural war in parenting, just like there is in most areas of culture. And on one end, you have passive parenting, and on the other end, you have authorita authoritarian parenting. And so what I mean by passive parenting is the idea that you don't have to give any consequences to your kids, and if you just wait for them to calm down and talk them through it, that alone will be enough to help them change bad behavior. And this is, there's a number of people who think this, um, but it's, it's a bit naive. <laughs> Children do need consequences. But then there's another end, and kind of a pendulum swing from that, the idea that consequences alone will be enough to change your children. And that's a bit naive, too. Uh, it's, it's not uncommon for authoritarian parents to respond to the, the trends within passive parenting with the idea, oh, I don't need to do that. Just more consequences is the answer. But as you consider these ideas, I want to point out two passages of Scripture. Let's look at Proverbs 22, verse 15 again. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. And then just five chapters later, another verse that is also true. Let's look at Proverbs 27, verse 22. Crush a fool in a mortal with a pestle along with crushed grain, yet his folly will not depart from him. That sounds like quite a consequence. Getting crushed. So both of the... This is not a contradiction, this is a paradox, or a bit of one. There, there's some nuance to it. Um, but both of these passages are true at the same time. So if you haven't thought about that before, then, then chew on that some this week. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him, and at the same time, crush a fool and a mortal with a pestle along with crushed grain, yet his folly will not depart from him. Think about that a bit this week. Both of those passages are true, which means life is complicated. Mm -hmm. Life is complicated and filled with nuance. Even though consequences are a necessary part of helping a child learn, there's more that they need than just consequences. So when I say guidance, kind of like what I talked about when describing uh, passive parenting. Guidance is the idea of sitting down with your child and talking through them their misbehavior, talking to them about why they misbehaved and how they could have responded. And they do need that. That shouldn't replace consequences, but that should go alongside consequences. That's a very good idea and a helpful thing that they need but we're just going to call that guidance. Consequences and guidance are not mutually exclusive, even though there's a bit of a, a cultural war in parenting that going on where one side only emphasizes guidance and the other side only emphasizes consequences. Consequences and guidance are not mutually exclusive, and there is no reason that you can't use both of them at the same time. And you should use both of them at the same time. Probably most of the time, or every time. So let me give an example of using consequences and guidance at the same time. So let's say little Jimmy hits his sister for using a toy he wanted. How should you respond? Well, first off, discipline him for it. He shouldn't have hit his sister, and he needs to learn that there's going to be consequences. So discipline him for it. But after giving him a chance to calm down, after having discipline to him, 
also talk to him about it. You know, I'll give an example of a conversation. Jimmy, why did you hit your sister? Well, because I was so mad that she took the toy I wanted. I can understand how that made you mad, but that doesn't give you the right to hit her. How do you think that made her feel? Bad, I guess. Uh, What do you think you can do next time you get mad to deal with your anger without hitting people? And you know, the child might come up with some good ideas, and if they don't, you can help them come up with good ideas. But it's, it's a good habit to use consequences and guidance. Because sometimes, you know, a lot of misbehavior comes from children not knowing how to cope with their emotions. And, uh, and consequences are helpful, but so is guidance. Sometimes knowing how to practically cope with difficult emotions isn't intuitive. Sometimes they need an adult to tell them how to cope with difficult emotions. So you should give them consequences and guidance. You are much more likely to be effective in changing behavior if you give consequences and guidance. But I want to mention another really important benefit of regularly having talks with them like this about their their disobedience or their misbehavior uh, and why you should use this alongside consequences. Well, uh, let's mention a few benefits of it. First off, it's going to help them to learn quicker Um, because they need motivation to change, but they also need to know how to make changes. And giving them this practical guidance will help them to learn quicker than if they had to figure it out on their own. Also, it might help them learn things that they just otherwise wouldn't learn at all. Because sometimes learning certain lessons or figuring out how to deal with certain temptations just doesn't come naturally. Sometimes it just doesn't come intuitively, even if you have motivation. But to me, one of the... um, the biggest benefits of using, of having conversations like this regularly with your children, of using guidance and consequences, is having conversations like this with them regularly will cause you to have more natural opportunities to have conversations about the gospel and about grace. Because if you regularly talk to them about why they disobeyed, sooner or later, they're going to say things like, I feel like I just can't be kind to others. Or I feel like I just can't control my anger. And you know what? There's a little bit of truth in that. There's a little bit of truth in those feelings. Even though on some level they can be kind to others and they can control their anger. You know, physically we all can obey God. But to some extent, morally, we're broken and can't. And if they start to say things in your conversations with them about why they disobeyed, like I feel like I just can't be kind to others or I can't control my anger, that's the perfect time to start talking to them about Jesus, about their need for Jesus and their need for the Holy Spirit and the need for God's practical and tangible grace. And those conversations are going to come up more frequently than they otherwise would if you have a habit of talking to your children about why they misbehaved or why they disobeyed. So again, this is not mutually exclusive to consequences. You should use consequences and guidance. Even though we've got a bit of a culture war going on saying just use one or the other, use both. Use both. And it really is important that that last benefit I mentioned about this is probably going to cause more natural conversations to come up where you can talk about grace and about the gospel. That's a big deal. All right, last tip I want to mention. Use natural or logical consequences whenever possible. So I'm going to explain what I mean by natural consequences and what I mean by logical consequences. Natural consequences are consequences that just come on their own naturally from their actions. If a child refuses to eat dinner, there's no need to punish them for it. Just let them be hungry. They'll come back for dinner eventually. They're not going to go indefinitely without eating. God has given them a built-in device in their bodies that's going to tell them to stop that. It's called hunger. It's pretty effective. It's more effective than the near discipline will be. And this is one we've done with Jeremiah recently, but if they don't want to wait for their food to cool, you know, let them eat it hot. Jeremiah and I used to have these arguments, even though he's, he's still only somewhat conversational, about, you know, 
the pizza rolls just came out of the microwave, and they're piping hot, and I don't want him to burn himself. So I, I make them wait for what, what I think is good for, to wait for pizza rolls, five minutes. After five minutes, they're the ideal temperature. But Jeremiah would always cry about it, and, uh, and usually cry and kick and scream. And eventually I realized, this, this isn't something I need to be protecting him from, actually. Now, when the pizza rolls come out of the microwave, I just put them within arm's reach. And he'll touch them, and he'll say, hot. And then he'll wait 30 seconds, and he'll touch them again, and he'll say, hot. And then eventually he'll figure out when they're cool, and he'll eat them. And he may have, he may have burned his tongue once or twice when I first saw her doing it, but he doesn't do it anymore. And he also doesn't cry about it anymore. <laughs> Natural consequences, whenever you can afford to use them, tend to be more effective than discipline. You know, if your teenager wants to stay up late on a school night, let them stay up and let them be tired the next day. Uh, Daniel was telling me how his parents did this with him and his siblings at a certain point. Am I right? Yep. yep. And, uh, and they stayed up too late once or twice. And then they were tired, and they got sick of it. And so they just started going to bed at a reasonable hour on their own. Because no one wants to be tired the next day. So that's natural consequences. Let me explain what I mean by logical consequences. Logical consequences, the difference are that logical consequences are imposed, but they're connected to the specific offense that was committed. For example, if your child is recklessly playing with something and they break it, they have to pay for it. Rather than just giving them some other type of punishment and not making them pay for it, no need to, to use a different type of punishment, just make them pay for it. By doing that, you're helping them learn responsibility, and that's what they're going to have to do when they're an adult. If they're an adult and they accidentally break the neighbor's window, they're not going to get grounded for it. They're going to have to pay for the neighbor's window. You know, if they eat their siblings' candy, make them replace their siblings' candy. And again, doing, disciplining that way is teaching them responsibility. It's, you're teaching them to make up for what they did wrong. So let's briefly talk about why natural consequences tend to be more effective or, or why, they're, why you should use them whenever possible. Um, well, for, they tend to be more effective at helping children learn and at helping teenagers learn, and that's because they're more likely to cause an actual change in thinking. If I just repeatedly tell Jeremiah, don't touch the pizza rolls when they first come out of the microwave, he doesn't know that they're hot, and his thinking has not been changed. But now that he's touched them when they've come out of the microwave, his thinking has changed. He knows that they're hot. A change in thinking has happened, and changes in thinking cause lasting change in a person, typically. So natural consequences and logical consequences tend to be more effective. So use natural consequences whenever possible. But I have to say, it's not always possible or reasonable to use natural consequences. You know, if your child wants to play in the street, they could hit by a car. They could get hit by a car. And if they do, they probably won't play in the street anymore. But that's too high of a cost to learn that lesson. Sometimes you simply can't allow natural consequences. Namely, any natural consequence that's going to cause permanent damage. Don't allow that. But wherever you can afford to use natural consequences, they're more effective and more helpful. So that brings us to our conclusion. Uh, there's th three things I want to say in conclusion. So first off, I want to repeat, discipline is a spectrum, not a binary matter. When you're evaluating your parenting, which you should do, don't ask yourself, do I discipline my children? Ask yourself, how effectively do I discipline my children? Are there areas I could improve? Am I reasonable about it? Is it actually helping them? Is there anything I could do better? Discipline is a spectrum. You can be doing it effectively or ineffectively, and there's a lot of different points of effectiveness or ineffectiveness with it. It's not a binary matter. Uh, secondly, I just kind of want to repeat those tips again, just to help us remember them. So always punish defiance, pick reasonable rules, don't punish things you didn't tell them are wrong, be prepared to handle negative responses to discipline, 
uh, like whining, retaliation, or insincere repentance. Try to understand the reason behind their behavior. Uh, Number six, give them both consequences and guidance. And that one... That one might be one of the most important ones. And use natural consequences and logical consequences whenever possible. The last one I want to say in conclusion, which we don't have time to get into the nuance on today, so I just want you to think about it on your own. Effective discipline and reasonable discipline is going to look very different at different ages. It's going to look very different at different ages. And I don't have time to to tell you how, but uh, keep that in mind and think about it on your own and study it for, uh, for yourself. So let's close in prayer, and then we'll have our communion meditation. Dear Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you um, that you are a loving and reasonable Father, and you discipline us appropriately. We thank you that you do love us enough to discipline us. We pray that we would learn from your discipline, and we pray that we would learn wisdom, and you would help us to know how to discipline our children effectively. Uh, We pray that you would uh, supernaturally bless us with wisdom from your Holy Spirit, and we pray that you would make the discipline that we give our children effective, and we pray that you would bless them. We thank you for your grace, and amen. Today's communion meditation is called Jesus is Ready to Forgive. Let's look at Luke 23, verse 34. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. So I just read this verse without the the greater context that it's in. And we all kind of know and remember the greater context that it's in, but but it can really help to, to just freshly think about it. So let's look at this after remembering the context. Jesus was arrested in the middle of the night when he was probably tired. He was taken by force with weapons. And they beat him and they whipped him. They accused him of a crime he didn't commit. And they beat him and whipped him and made fun of him. They spit in his face. They put nails through his hands and his feet. They hung him to die, and they had no remorse for what they did. They saw him suffering, and they made fun of his suffering. They didn't care about the agony he was in. I kind of doubt the Roman soldiers even cared about whether or not he did the crime, and they had no remorse for it at all. And Jesus forgave them. But one thought exercise I want us to do, imagine this happened to you. Imagine you go to some city that, you know, isn't your home, and you get... Uh, kidnapped, taken by force with weapons in the middle of the night, and then, you know, the day goes by, you haven't slept, you probably haven't had a chance to eat anything, they accuse you of a crime you didn't commit, they beat you, they whip you, they make fun of you, they spit in your face, they put thorns in your head, they make you carry a giant piece of wood up a hill when you're tired and bleeding and haven't eaten and haven't slept. And they're impatient with you and they're yelling at you. And they hang you up to die. And they have no remorse for what they did. That would make me mad. And Jesus responds, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And this was before they realized what a mistake they had made. This was before the earthquake and the sky turning black. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They do not what they do. Look at how ready to forgive Jesus is. Look at how merciful he is. We should never doubt God's willingness to forgive us when we come to him in repentance. Let's praise him as we come to the table.